Hi there, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at the Edge Church. Really glad that you've decided to tune in and join with us today. Whether you call the Edge Church your home uh, or you're really just checking us out here online, uh, you're interested in this sermon or sermon series, uh, we're glad to have you. I really do hope and pray that the message today ministers to your soul, points you towards Jesus, and helps you grow in him. Uh, today, we're continuing on in our sermon series through the book of 1 Peter that we're calling Resurrection Hope, where the apostle Peter has been teaching the church. He's teaching us about what it means and what it looks like for us to live as followers of Jesus, fueled by hope in him as ambassadors of his kingdom in a world that's broken and hurting and even hostile to the Christian faith. And so, so Peter's writing this letter to the church, to us, to encourage us and stir us up in faith, to, to spur us on in our affection and, and in our action for Jesus and to root us in an eternal hope in him. And so if you haven't already, grab a Bible. Go ahead, grab something to write on, something to write with. As we go through, take some notes, highlight some things. Um, Hold on to something from the message today that, that God wants to continue to speak to you, have you pray into, or maybe even share with others. But I'm going to pray for us, uh, then we're going to jump in our message together. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for today. Father, thank you for this moment that you've given to us to open your word. Lord, help us to hear your voice today. God, help us to grab hold of what you want to speak to us. Lord, plant that like a seed deep in our hearts, I pray today. And and Lord, just grow that in us to produce a good fruit in our lives and through our lives. So Lord, help us just listen today. Help us to be open to you today. God, give us wisdom and revelation as we look at your word. Minister, I pray, in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so today we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. Specifically, we're going to look at verses 12 through 19. But before we do, I just want to kind of catch you up to where we are. So, so remember, this is the Apostle Peter. He's writing to the church in that, that's really been scattered through what is modern day Turkey that he refers to as God's elect exiles. That's what Peter calls them. He, he sets up this letter by reminding the church and really all of us today that, that we've been picked by God for the moment that we find ourselves in as exiles, which is really just to say that, that, that where we are is not our home. To be in exile is to be different from the rest is to be even rejected at times and not welcomed in some spaces, to maybe even be seen as weird by the culture that we're in because we are aliens or, or strangers here on the earth. So we're not just settlers, we're sojourners on our way to our heavenly home with God forever. And, and so, so then our lives and our, and our words and our conduct and our values are, are going to reflect a different kingdom, a heavenly kingdom that's different from this earthly kingdom and reflective of its kings. And, and because then we're not aligned and oriented around the same king and the purposes of the culture, this will inevitably create some rub. Right? There, there's going to so, at times be some conflict with those who aren't living for God and his kingdom. I told you even when we began this sermon series that I'm feeling this more than ever today uh, as a follower of Jesus. I feel more understood and more mischaracterized as in our culture than I did even 10 years ago. That the world feels more strange, more angry, more hostile to me than ever before. And I, and I know this is true for a lot of people as well. And, and really, if I'm being honest, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's changing anytime soon. As I look at our world, as I look at our, its values, as I look at government and all the stuff that's happening, I don't, I don't really see that as moving from where, where we are right now. But, but at the same time, God has placed me and God has placed you here for such a time as this, to be light, to be salt in our world, to be ambassadors of his kingdom, pointing people with our words and our witness to the answer for all of life's darkness and hatred and, and oppression and brokenness and the sin in our world. It's to pointing people to Jesus. And, and so Peter has been writing the church to encourage us to this end, to live with a hope that is set on Jesus, no matter what comes our way or comes against us. And every chapter of this letter, Peter has been addressing then the issue of suffering. And guess what? Peter's not done yet. Uh, Peter knows and understands that there is sorrow and suffering in this life for everybody, and even more so as a follower 
of Jesus. And so he wants to help to shape our, our understanding and our perspective around suffering so that even in the midst of it, we can stand as witnesses of Jesus and glorify God. And so let's look at this together. First Peter chapter four, starting in verse 12. And, and notice the first word here in this verse, beloved. That's what that's where Peter starts. The very first thing Peter wants you and I to know as we hold on to and face hardship and suffering is, is that we are loved. W one of the things I actually love about Peter is that though he's considered to be among the first of all apostles, he really sees himself and presents himself as a pastor. And, and as a pastor, out of love for you, part of the job is to remind you as God's people of who you are and whose you are so that you can faithfully follow Jesus come what may. And so Peter says, listen, church, first things first, right? You are loved, yeah, by me as your pastor, but more importantly, by God himself. And, and why is it so important that Peter starts here? Be, because if you miss this, or if you miss the fact that you are loved by God, then you are far more easily prone to believe the lie that says that when you're suffering, that God doesn't really love you. That, that, that God's actually against you rather than for you. And so, so you need to do something then to, in order to earn that love again so that the suffering might end. And that's really just a lie. God, God doesn't tether his love to you by your works for him. He loves you because you're his son. He loves you because you're his daughter. He loves you because you're his Beloved, what Peter says here, meaning that you are the object of his illimitable, permanent, divine love. Some of, some of us need to like really get in here today that, that your health struggles are not because God doesn't love you. That, 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 your, that your financial struggles, your, your career struggles, not because God doesn't love you. The, the struggles you're having in your marriage, the struggles you're having with your kids, the struggles you're having with other people is not because God doesn't love you. Listen, listen to how the Apostle Paul says it to us in Romans chapter 8. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, as it's written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life or angels or rulers nor the present or things to come or powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, what, whatever happens, whatever may come against us, nothing can change God's love for you. You're loved. Don't lose that truth, right? No matter what comes, don't lose this truth. It's the foundation by which everything else is, in your life is going to be built. God loves you. And so Peter says, listen, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, now, now we all know that there's all kinds of suffering that happens in our lifetime. Right? Like there's all kinds of things that we endure and go through as people. But Peter here is talking about a specific kind of suffering that's, that's more of a persecution where, where others are coming against you because of your faith in Jesus, where, where, where we are ridiculed and, and insulted and rejected and, and not welcomed, where, where, where we are thought less of, treated less than, seen as an obstacle or an enemy because of our following Jesus, which because of the way we live differently from the world. And so Peter says, listen, when this happens, when this kind of suffering comes your way, rejoice. That's what he says in verse 13. And rejoice here is not written as like a piece of advice or a good suggestion. This is, this is really a command. This is to be our posture and our practice that when you're thrown into the cellars of suffering, rejoice. That, that when you dive into the sea of affliction, rejoice. That, that when you suffer for the sake of Christ, rejoice. And that's not normal, right? That's not like our normal disposition. This is a supernatural way of responding to suffering. It's not in our own power. It's not for our own honor. It's the way of spiritual exiles living on earth for the glory of the king. When the apostle James tells us in, in his book to count it all joy 
when you face trials of many kinds, that's an altogether foolish instruction apart from one thing, God. So, so because we are completely loved and in the care of God, Peter's now going to give us six reasons for why we can rejoice in the face of suffering. Here's the first one he points to. Rejoice because suffering is not a surprise but a plan. He says in verse 12, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter's like, listen, don't let suffering shock you. Don't, don't be surprised that by really following Jesus that, that you face some things and some obstacles and some people come against you. Well, wh why not? Well, for one, because Jesus said it would happen. Right? John chapter 15, verse 18 to 20, Jesus says, listen, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus tells us, listen, expect to be treated the way that I was. If I was ridiculed, if I was insulted, if I was rejected and betrayed and attacked, don't be surprised then when it happens to you too. And now this doesn't mean like we go looking for persecution. Right? It's not like we're, we're trying to be martyrs just by, by running into stuff. This is, this is just saying like don't avoid the persecution and it's going to come. Don't be surprised when it happens. If you're going to really live for Jesus and follow him, this is the way. Now, that word surprise here means more than just shock. It, 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 it really means also that like to, to not be disillusioned by not have it be a disillusionment that results in sort of this bitter resentment. OK, so it's like it's almost like this idea that that don't let the stuff that comes against you, that comes your way, lead you away from the heart of God, lead you away from the truth of God. Make you believe something untrue about God and cower in fear and ultimately embitter you. Because the, the truth is that that suffering, Peter Stiles here, it's not meaningless. It's not arbitrary. It's purposeful and it's even for your good. So, so treat suffering as an invited guest rather than an unwelcome stranger. P Peter calls this suffering a fiery trial that comes upon you to test you. Teachers test students. Suffering tests Christians. A test reveals something so that you can know and you can grow. So, so suffering is to serve a purpose in our life. In fact, in verse 19, Peter will actually say that, that suffering is, the, that, that this happens according to the will of God. That, that, that'll mess with some people's theology, right? But this means that suffering is not an oops on God's part. God, God like didn't forget about you. God wasn't not paying attention. He didn't overlook you. It's not outside of his will, but it's in his will. And he's using this suffering to change you and bring about his eternal purposes. Peter, he actually flushes this out a bit more in verses 17 and 18. So we're going to jump ahead here. And he says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, when you hear judgment, don't automatically think of condemnation, okay? That's not what it always means. In, in this context, it's the idea of a trial that's intended for a purpose, to bring about a sifting, to take away what should not be so that only what should be actually remains. He, he, so Peter says, like, like, it's time for judgment to begin the household, and if it begins with us being Christians, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? This is a quote from Proverbs 11.31. And what, what Peter's wanting us to know here and hold on to is that the judgment of God will happen for every single person on the earth and no one will escape it. But when the fire of God's judgment burns and comes against the church, it is for testing and proving and purifying. We, we talked about this back in chapter one, but, but when the fire of God comes and it burns on the world, it either awakens or it destroys, it consumes. 
God's judgment is starting with his church because God is using this the pain and persecution to refine us as his people, to weed out and to sift through the fiery trials the impurities of sin and self-righteousness that keep us from our fullness in Christ and detract us from our gospel witness and the glory of God. God is using suffering to make us more like Jesus. We, we, again, James talks about this in his book. He, he tells us that these trials are to test our faith. He says to develop our perseverance and to make us mature and complete. And so it's actually through testing that you get strong. It's through testing that you become able to persevere, which means that you're able to stand up under a very heavy weight. C.S. Lewis was once asked, why is it that the righteous suffer? And his answer was simply, why not? They're the only ones who could take it. Per persevering in suffering makes you strong and ultimately helps you to grow. You become mature and complete. That's what James says. It's like, like through that, that you become, you're refined into being the man or the woman that God has created and destined you to be, to fulfill the purpose he made you for. God is transforming you in your character through suffering. It's revealing your faith and it's proving that you belong to God. And so while it might not feel good to us, it is good for us. God uses our trials and suffering to purify us. He also uses them to humble us, right? It, trials and, and suffering like keep us from being all proud and puffed up. The Apostle Paul speaks of this very thing himself. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, so to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. He says, listen, a thorn, a suffering was given to me to keep me from being proud, to keep me from sitting on the throne of my own heart and my own life. Suffering will purify you, but it will also humble you to keep you dependent on God. That's what it does. When Paul talks about suffering this thorn, he says that, that he prays to the Lord three times to take it from him. You remember what God said to Paul? He talks about this in, starting in verse 9. He says, God says, but my grace is sufficient for you. God's answer to Paul is like, it's, that's all you need is my grace. He says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says to that, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. There's a strange but awesome thing about God's strength and God's power, and it's that it seems to be attracted to human humility and weakness. God's power seems to kick in when our power runs out. Listen to this. No one, no one is ever too weak to be spiritually strong. We're only ever too strong, right? We're never too weak to be spiritually powerful. We're just too strong in and of ourselves so that we keep the power of God at bay. Peter says, don't be surprised by suffering like Jesus. Know that God's in it to purify you and to humble you and to keep you dependent upon him. So don't run from it. Lean into God and rejoice because suffering's not surprising. It's purposeful. Secondly, Peter will say here, listen, rejoice because suffering's an evidence of your union with Christ. Look at verse 13. It says, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. It's been said that, that God has only one son without sin, but none without sorrow. To walk with Jesus, to live as Christ lived, is to suffer as Christ suffered. So when people insult you, when they despise you, when they reject you, when they do wrong against you because you live the way of Jesus and represent him, you're sharing in the suffering of Christ. That's what Peter's saying. And this isn't like some mystical kind of thing. It's like we share in his suffering because Christ in his doing good and his living for the Father was despised, insulted, rejected too, right? So, so the fact is that they'll treat you like they treated him and the fact that they do proves that you are united with Christ. And this is reason to rejoice, Right? I mean, this is what we see in the apostles. Acts chapter 5, it tells us that they're flogged, that they're beaten, that they're imprisoned. And it says that they left there in Acts chapter 5, 41. It says that they go away rejoicing. And why? Well, it says because they had been counted worthy, worthy to share 
in the sufferings of Christ. Suffering for the sake of Jesus, because you're living for him, because you're sharing him with others, because there's things you don't go along with, and so people come against you. That's an evidence of your union with God. You are in him, and he is in you. Thirdly here, Peter tells us to rejoice in suffering because there's a greater joy that's coming for us with Christ forever. At the end of verse 13, he says that you also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Notice it says this, rejoice now so that you can rejoice then. Our joy now through suffering is the means of attaining our joy then, only a thousandfold in glory with God forever. Glory always follows suffering. Peter told us that back in chapter 1, verse 11, when he talks about how the Spirit predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glory to follow. Paul writes about this in Romans 8, 17, where he says that if we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. First, the suffering, then the glory, both for Jesus and for those who are united to him. If there can be joy now in your pain, when Jesus comes back and eradicates all the suffering and pain, there will only be overjoy. So there's a hope in our suffering that we can hold on to that can help carry us through it. We see this expressed throughout the New Testament about how our trials can't compare to the glory that is coming for us in Christ. Romans 8 is a great book, a great chapter. Go read that sometime this week. But, but listen to Paul here in 2 Corinthians 4. And, and keep in mind here as we even read this, that this is a guy who was insulted, beaten, stoned, in prison, and ultimately killed for following Jesus. And he says this starting in verse 16. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Listen to this, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul says, listen, this suffering for Jesus today on earth, it's light and brief compared to the weight of glory and the joy that's going to be yours forever. When when you suffer for Jesus, there's a hope that that is to be had in what is coming that nothing else can touch. So rejoice, Pope Peter says to us, rejoice that what is before you is so much bigger and greater than anything you're going through today. Fourth thing here, Peter says, rejoice in suffering because you're blessed with the Spirit's power and presence. Look at verse 14. It says, if you're insulted for the name of Jesus, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That, that, that phrase there, the Spirit of glory, the Spirit of God, it's used all throughout the scriptures to describe the unique fullness and presence of the Holy Spirit among God's people in the midst of suffering. Peter's saying that in our times of greatest suffering on the earth, there's an even greater support to us from heaven, God, the Holy Spirit, who empowers you and sustains you. That, that, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, Scripture tells us, that lives in us. Uh, Isaiah eleven two 2 says that the spirit rested upon Jesus. And Peter's saying to us here that the same spirit that carried Jesus through his suffering is the same spirit who's going to walk with you and carry you through yours. So rejoice. God is with you. God will see you through. Fifth thing he says here, rejoice in suffering because it glorifies God. Verses 15 and 16, it says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. I love that one. Don't be a murderer or a meddler, right? Two things that seem really far apart. But, 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 but here's what Peter's saying. Listen, don't suffer because of your own bad sinful choices. That, that, that's not sharing in the suffering of Christ. That, that's actually just sharing in the work of the devil the kingdom of darkness, right? You don't share in the suffering of Christ when you suffer because of your own bad choices. And yet, he says in verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, something that's really interesting here about this verse is that that's one of the only three times in the entire Bible where that word Christian is actually used. The, the early church never called themselves Christians. In fact, they, they called themselves believers or, or people of the way or the brethren. Christian was, was really a derogatory term that was used by the Romans and the Greeks uh, who wanted to give this group of people a name that set them apart from everybody else, that made them other. 
right? Most people of the Roman Empire were called uh, Caesarianos, and uh, which was meant followers of Caesar, whose allegiance was to him. But 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 these Christians were people who didn't give their allegiance to Caesar. They didn't live according to the culture and the way of the Roman Empire. But 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 instead they followed this Jesus. So they were called Christianos, people uh, uh, who whose claim was that was Jesus is Lord. That's who this group of people were. And so Peter's like, hey, be these kinds of people who aren't ashamed to be identified with Jesus, to stand with him, to stand for him, whose allegiance is Jesus because this glorifies God. Glorifying God means to show with your actions, attitudes, and words that God is glorious to you, that, 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 that he is most valuable, most precious, most desirable, and satisfying. And the greatest way to show that is to keep rejoicing in him when everything else is being taken and fallen away. When you keep rejoicing in God in the midst of suffering, it shows that God and not any of these other things in our life are of the greatest source of our joy. And, and this is the purpose of suffering for Christ, the glory of God. I, I don't know if you found this to be true in your own life or not, but I know for me that what awes and inspires me and stirs up faith in me is not when I see those people who seemingly have everything, life is perfect, health, all that stuff, thanking and praising God. That, that, that's not what really grips my heart and stirs my affection for the Lord. It's when I see people who, are, who seem to be losing everything, who, who, people who have lost greatly, and yet they still love the Lord and proclaim him and thank and praise his name. This kind of joy is really an indictment and an invitation to a world that's searching for satisfaction and glory in everything else but Jesus. And for us to display that Jesus is more satisfying and glorious than all those other things they run to for meaning and joy and comfort, for us to say Jesus is better, that's what moves people, that's what glorifies God to rejoice in suffering because it glorifies God and points others to his goodness. L last one here, Peter tells us, rejoice in suffering because your creator is faithful to care for your soul. Verse 19 says, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This verse is a little bit of a summary of all that Peter has been teaching about suffering. That, that, that we suffer according to God's will, not in, in absence of it. It's not accidental. It's not incidental. Nothing happens outside of God's plan and purpose and pleasure. As Genesis 50, 20 even reminds us that even what, the, what has been done as evil against us, God turns for good. So, so then Peter says, entrust yourself to him. That, that, that word entrust is actually a banking term. And it's really the picture of depositing what is most valuable to another for safekeeping. And, and, and guess what? Like, like there's nothing and no one who's going to be more able to keep you and hold you and sustain you and see you through than the God who created you. In fact, this verse also is the only time in the entire New Testament where God is referred to as creator. And, and Peter's making a point here. He's trying to say, hey, remember who it is who holds you. It's the one who made you. This is the designer, the author of life, who's sovereign over every single thing that he's made, which includes you. This God is faithful. Well, faithful to what? To himself? To his word? To his promises? To his own nature? To his own steadfast love and infinite mercy? To his own intention to finish what he started in you? To his own divine insistence on loving you entirely and perfectly forever? I, I love how 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us, even if we are faithless, it says, he remains faithful for he cannot deny who he is. God is going to be faithful. We can count on him. And because he is, we can move from fear and doubt in our suffering to faith and joy in it because he's got us, because he's good, because he's faithful and he will not fail. So rejoice, church. That's what Peter's saying to the, to the church that's scattered, to us. That's his call to us. Rejoice in the Lord no matter what comes your way or what comes against you. And how might we do this? What might that look like? Well, notice the last three words here in verse 19. While doing good. That's what Peter says. While doing good. A better translation here would be continue to be doing 
what is good. Think, think about this. If doing good is what got you in trouble to begin with, if, that, if that's really what led to your suffering, the natural inclination, the natural thought would be like, well, I should stop doing this then. Right? Like, I should just shut up. I shouldn't be so bold. I shouldn't say this kind of stuff. I shouldn't put myself out there. I, I, I should really just not speak up and keep to myself. And Peter's like, no, 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 don't do that. that, that that's, not what it, that's not what it is. That's not, rather do this. And trust yourself to God, to the, to the God who is faithful, to the God who loves you, to the God who holds you, and continue doing good. Continue walking in this way. He's like, put Jesus on display. Be his ambassador. Let your light shine before men, as Jesus tells us. Rejoice in the Lord and do good. That's the call. And in this, we glorify God. May this be our prayer and our practice as we follow Jesus. Lord, let us rejoice in you. God, help us to continue to do good, standing for you with our words and our witness. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word today. God, I thank you for how, Lord, you encourage us to follow you and Lord, that you give us exactly what we need as we do. And so Lord, thanks for a word that reminds us of a joy that can be ours even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of, of people coming against us because of our love for you, God because of our witness. And Lord, I pray that it would encourage every single one of us, Lord, to walk in boldness and courage. Lord, to not be afraid to put you on display, to not be afraid to proclaim your name. Lord, to not be afraid of what might come our way as we align ourselves with you. Holy Spirit, I pray even that you would lead us in that. God, give us just a boldness and a confidence in you, Jesus. Lord, may our lives be a reflection of joy in you. God, that we just rejoice in you, God, every step of the way along the way, come what may. Lives that glorify you, God. Every way in us, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>